This is part of a series I call the Making Evidence-Based Medicine Simple Series, or MESS for short. In MESS Minis, we review an essential EBM concept. In this MESS Mini, we will discuss how to interpret kaplan meier survival curves. kaplan meier survival curves are typically used to present the impact of a prognostic factor or intervention on disease mortality over time, hence the word survival in the name. But they are not limited to that use. They represent a time-to-event analysis, that is, the time of an outcome after a relevant exposure or intervention. kaplan meier survival curves can also be used to compare the influence on disease mortality of two or more prognostic factors or interventions. kaplan meier survival curves graph outcome events over time. The x-axis represents the time interval, in this example, years. The y-axis represents the percent survival with 100% at the top and 0% at the bottom. In a prospective cohort design, we start by enrolling patients and then follow them over time to determine their disease outcome. Notice that the patients were enrolled at different times and followed for varying lengths of time. Our data table starts by lining up the patients so that the survival time can be compared. Once we order the patients by length of survival, we can begin to calculate survival rates. Survival at the current level is calculated as the number of patients surviving divided by the number of patients at risk. At year zero, seven of seven, or 100% of the patients are alive. At year one, six of seven, or 86% of the patients survive. At year two, four of six, or 67% survive, and at year 3, 1 of 4, or 25% survive. However, there is one more step before we can plot the curve. The percent surviving is not the absolute probability of surviving that we just calculated on the last slide. It is the cumulative probability of surviving each of the preceding time intervals. It is calculated by multiplying the probability of surviving at the current time with the cumulative probability of surviving to the previous time. For example, the cumulative probability of survival at year 3 is the probability of survival at year 3 multiplied by the cumulative probability of survival at year 2. This is 25% times 58%, which equals 15%. Note that the direction of the curve is downsloping. There is an inverse relationship between survival and time. Survival decreases as time increases. The curves are not actually curves, but follow a stepwise progression. The downward portion of the curves represent a decrease in survival. Notice that decreases in survival are documented only at each year interval on the graph. The horizontal portion of the curve represents an increase in time. These steps span the time interval. More than one prognostic factor or intervention can be plotted for comparison on a kaplan meier survival curve. In this example, the red curve represents survival over time in patients with a prognostic factor. The gray curve represents survival over time in patients without the prognostic factor. The gray curve has a larger area under the curve. That is, it has a higher survival over time than the red curve. This indicates that there is greater survival in those without the prognostic factor. There are statistical tests that can be used to determine if there is a statistically significant difference between the two curves. However, if the survival curves cross, these tests may not be able to detect a difference between the groups when one exists. The tests include the log rank test. This is a qualitative test only. It provides only a p-value. The other test is the Cox proportional hazard model, which results in a hazard ratio, which is a quantitative measure. The Cox proportional hazard model is an example of a multivariable regression analysis. It can account for the effects of more than one independent variable. There are two primary measures of risk frequency. Prevalence is the number with the outcome at a point in time divided by the number at risk for the outcome at a point in time. For example, the prevalence of serious bacterial infection in febrile neonates is 10%. Incidence is a measure of risk which includes a time interval. Incidence is the number with the outcome over a specified time interval divided by the number at risk for the outcome over the specified time interval. For example, 
the incidence of death from acute lymphoblastic leukemia is 10% in the first year. Hazard ratios are utilized in time-to-event analyses. A hazard is the risk of an event or outcome over a specified time interval. A hazard rate is the risk of an event or outcome in a group over a specified time interval. The hazard rates may vary over the time of the analysis, but it is assumed that the hazard ratio is constant at any point in time during the study period. A hazard ratio is the hazard rate in one group divided by the hazard rate in another group over a specified time interval. In contrast to hazard ratios, with a specified time interval, relative risk and odds ratios are reported at a point in time, typically the end of the study. One way to distinguish them is that a hazard ratio is a ratio of incidences, while a relative risk or odds ratio is a ratio of prevalences. Hazard ratios are interpreted in the same manner as relative risk and odds ratio. A hazard ratio is a ratio of hazard rates. A hazard ratio greater than 1 indicates that the hazard rate of the outcome in the exposed group is greater than the hazard rate in the not exposed group over the specified time interval. A hazard ratio equal to 1 indicates that the hazard rate of the outcome in the exposed group is the same as the hazard rate in the not exposed group over the specified time interval. In other words, there is no difference between the two groups over the specified time interval. A confidence interval for a hazard ratio that includes 1 indicates that there is not a statistically significant difference between the exposed and not exposed groups over the specified time interval. Finally, a hazard ratio less than 1 indicates that the hazard rate of the outcome in the exposed group is lower than the hazard rate in the not exposed group over the specified time interval. It is important to be able to express a hazard ratio in a sentence using the study parameters. We will use the following template. A patient in the exposed group was hazard ratio times more likely to have an outcome than a patient in the not exposed group over the specified time interval. This is the same template that we use to express relative risk and odds ratios with the addition of the over the specified time interval phrase. In this example, a patient in the azithromycin group was 2.9 times more likely to have a cardiovascular death than a patient in the no antibiotic group over 60 days. The confidence interval for the hazard ratio does not include 1. Therefore, there is a statistically significant higher rate of 60-day cardiovascular death in the azithromycin group compared to the no antibiotic group. Lastly, we'll touch briefly on the concept of censored data. Sensor data occurs when the time of a patient's outcome is incomplete or missing. To illustrate this concept, we will consider a study with a duration of 5 years, which is indicated by the dashed vertical line. Patient 1 does not experience the outcome during the study period. Their outcome is at least as long as the study duration. Patient 2 does not experience the outcome and drops out before the completion of the study. These two types of patients are called right sensor data, which is the most common type of sensor data. In right sensor data, we know the time to event is greater than some value, but we do not know what that value is. There is also left sensor data and interval sensor data. Left sensor data occurs when we know that the time to event is less than some value, but do not know exactly what that value is. Interval data occurs when we know that the time to event is between two values, but do not know exactly what that value is. I will leave you to review these types of sensor data on your own. This is an example of a Kaplan-Meier curve indicating sensor data. Sensor data is often indicated by a vertical line or a dot at the time the patient is censored. The circle after the 5-year study period is a censored patient 1 that survived longer than 5 years. The circle before 3 years is censored patient 2 who dropped out of the study. This Kaplan-Meier survival curve indicates the number at risk and the number of censored at each time interval for the control and intervention groups. Small ticks on each curve indicate when sensor data occurred. How to handle sensor data in an analysis is complicated and beyond the scope of this talk. In short, there are four methods of dealing with sensor data. The complete data approach excludes sensor data. In addition to decreasing sample size, this approach may miss important information in the censored patients. The imputation approach is inputs missing data. For example, the missing data can be imputed in a best case or worst case scenario. This can provide the extremes but not the actual results. The dichotomous approach examines data at a fixed point and disregards survival time. 
The recommended approach is the likelihood-based approach, which adjusts for whether an observation is censored. This approach uses all of the data. This is the approach used by the log ranks test and the Cox proportional hazard model. It is important to remember that each of these four methods requires some assumptions about censored data. In summary, Kaplan-Meier curves represent a time-to-event analysis that plot the cumulative probability of an outcome over a specified time interval. Kaplan-Meier curves are usually used in prognosis studies where survival is the outcome, but can be used with any outcome that is followed over time. Two or more curves representing prognostic factors or interventions can be plotted and analyzed to determine if a statistically significant difference exists in the outcome over time. Hazard ratios are a quantitative measure to assess the difference between two groups in a time-to-event analysis.